Uh, I mean, there's a number of things here that go beyond my department's direct responsibility, but we have a responsibility to coordinate on. So, for example, you know, I, I, I um, am somewhat alarmed at the number of, of children or um, adolescents that may have been in state care that find themselves homeless after they leave state care. Um, uh, the number of rough sleepers in Dublin um, that, are, that, that have serious mental health and addiction problems isn't a surprise or news to me or anybody else who, who talks to or understands homelessness, but, but the response of the state in a, in a coordinated fashion I think needs serious consideration uh, in terms of how we help the voluntary sector and the charity sector and how we um, uh, give the supports through the HSE uh, you know, as well as other um, 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 state-owned agencies and bodies to get a more uh, effective and targeted outcome uh, to the needs of people, um, some of whom uh, uh, have, ha have real needs that are unmet at the moment. Um, so I can assure you, Deputy, I have spoken to, to quite a number of people who are homeless and many of the organisations that are trying to provide supports for those people. Um, uh, and we have a pretty um, good, although you can always learn more about people's lives uh, and the complexity of them uh, and how they find themselves in an extraordinarily difficult situation. But uh, again, our job is to try and put a more coordinated response in place to get better outcomes for people. You know, there will be some, and I'd, maybe I'll finish on this, there will be, there'll be some people on homelessness who will say things like, if you look at the percentage of rough sleepers per head of population in Dublin versus other European capitals, you know, Dublin's doing very well. I mean, that is, a, that is the kind of commentary that I can tell you we will reject out of hand um, the, the, because it is totally unhelpful uh, in terms of uh, the contribution that needs to happen towards dealing with rough, rough sleeping and homelessness uh, in Dublin. Um, so uh, I look forward to your, to your recommendations in terms of how we can improve that. Thank you, Minister. I just want to comment on one point that Deputy O'Brien made, um, and I know you don't have responsibility for all the areas associated, and I think that's, the, that's important that the issues uh, for those on the margins, whether it's the children or whatever, are adequately reflected through the Cabinet subcommittee. Uh, I think that's hugely important. And secondly, I just want to reiterate, all of our around this table are, are meeting people in different ways who are homeless and who are at risk of homelessness. But certainly those of us who travelled to Focus yesterday and met a collective group who were articulated, who were articulate in their presentation, explained clearly the risk of homelessness, how they fell into homelessness, living a life in homelessness, how they came through it. It was one of the, I suppose, the strongest presentations that this, the members of this committee will have met. And if you ever have the opportunity to meet, to meet a group like that, I think you'll find it beneficial. Um, I would have felt in advance of going to it, like most colleagues, sure, don't we know what homelessness is all about? We're all meeting them. But the presentation by the individuals themselves was really, really both moving and inspiring yesterday. Uh, a well worthwhile exercise to do. Deputy Cowan. Thanks, Chairman. Can I thank the Minister and his staff for coming here today? Can I uh, thank them in anticipation of the new space we're in uh, for the consultative process that's ongoing this committee has undertaken over the last number of weeks and I would hope and expect that when your strategy and policy is produced towards the end of July that we will be cognizant of the recommendations of this committee. Um, what we've had for the last number of years is undoubtedly, as we all know, a housing crisis. What we've had in the last 12 to 18 months is and has been an emergency. And it's an extraordinary emergency. And I would contend that conventional methods, conventional processes that may have worked in the past, I'm afraid haven't worked in recent years, are not working now, and won't work in the near future. These methods and, and processes, and while they were initially put in place with the best of intentions and the best interest of all concerned, are not cognizant of the situation we have on the ground today. And I'm conscious when I say that of the conventional planning process that is guided by county development plans that you know are sporadic, some are in the midst of a county development plan, some are within, in a review, but they're completely disjointed across the country from a county to county basis. Regional development plans, spatial strategies, none of which were designed to meet the emergency that now exists, and none of which should 
form the bedrock or be the foundation for resolving this issue that we face now. And this is the case both in the public sector and in the provision of public and social housing and in the case for private development. Even the Part A process, many would contend during the course of our deliberations, that that too has been shown to be flawed. Even Board Planola presently, I would contend, are not adequately resourced now, with, with, with funds or manpower, it would appear, to deal with the sort of level of applications that are necessary and that should be necessary and will be necessary to address this issue. And I'm conscious of the fact in my own constituency yesterday, uh, a most important project uh, by, where, where Board, Board, Board Namona had sought permission um, in relation to co-fueling. You know, co contested previously by Antashka after judicial review and the importance of that application to the region from which I reside and to the 600 jobs that emanate from it, where they could again yesterday for the second time seek an extension of time before they could make a decision on that issue. And what effect that has on a region or the forward planning of the company involved. But it's only an instance, it's only an example of the obvious flaws and the obvious delays that are evident there and that need to be addressed and need to be addressed quickly. The delivery of residential units from conception to design to planning to procurement and construction is way too long and way too costly. And it's way too long in the public sector as it is in the private sector. And you say that the, you know, the, 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 the process within the department and local authorities from conception to the handover of the keys has been reduced from eight stages to four. And that was done over a year ago, I believe. But well, it's still every bit as slow and cumbersome as it was some years ago as it is today. In the area of costs, the cost of funds, the VAT, the development charges, the site costs, the certification, the compliance and the regulations are all combining to make it most difficult. And we have yet to get a, an absolute handle on the cost of construction when you consider everything that's involved. Conventional methods of funding are, to, are, are also outdated. And in the real world, banks are not lending to developers at the rate in which they need to do. And in the real world, the fiscal rules, uh, such as they are presently, bars this state, bars government from providing the extraordinary amount of funding that is necessary in order to provide the extraordinary amount of units that's required. So we have to think outside the box, we have to find new means and new methods. And I would, you know, and I, you know, we heard NAMA here the other day. One of the success stories of NAMA has been the NARPS uh, proposal and the NARPS initiative, which is a special purpose vehicle uh, you know, that can purchase units and lease uh, for, for periods of time. And I think this government must seriously consider, in this emergency, putting in place a special purpose vehicle or a housing authority that can learn from that and that can... Um, you know, put in, that authority can, can seek funding from the likes of the NTMA, as we heard during the week. It can also receive and, 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 and attribute funding from the credit unions, who are very anxious to get into this game, who are very anxious to play their part, to play their role, and, it get, and, and, and achieve a better return than they're getting presently for having it in the pillar banks who are not lending it on to others when it's required. Um, and they then can fund... They can lend, they can fund, they can build, they can enter joint ventures in providing units for local authorities, for approved housing bodies and for colleges. Because the colleges too were sucking up a lot of the residential properties in the centres in which they are. And you heard during the course of the last number of weeks what stood out was, was Maynooth especially. Nearly the whole of Kildare is taken up with students seeking accommodation uh, to get to and from Maynooth University. And, and they too, whether, whether, they, whether they receive funding from this authority, whether they become an approved housing body, but they have a role to play and they can do on-campus site, it is available to them and must be forthcoming. That authority can also bring forward emergency alterations to legislation. When we sat in emergency sitting, sittings to deal with banking crisis, we can sit in emergency, sit, we can have emergency sittings to deal with this crisis. And that authority, um, you know, must look at the, the, the methods of planning, the funding models to local authorities. And in terms, its terms of reference relate to maybe some Part 8 type planning for a window 
of, of time, for a period of time to deal with this, whether it's a two-year or three-year span, in order for us, for that authority, to do what we wanted to do, to get on with the job of driving the development and the construction and the provision of residential units to deal with this crisis. And, you know, it can, it can, it can also um, seek to provide incentives in relation to local authorities or the private sector in relation to the CPO powers. And that offers an opportunity to revitalise towns and villages. You know, and I heard uh, again, and the, the person from the NTMA talk about the funding that is also already being provided under the capital uh, development program in relation to funds to local authorities for larger towns. He mentioned. We well, you know, as many members of this committee have said over the past number of weeks, this crisis, this emergency extends beyond the large urban centres. As, as crucial and as pivotal and as focused as it is here, there's no doubt. But in, in the town I come from, in the villages that I know, there's every bit as much a crisis there too. When you have 50% of your representations in your, at our clinics throughout the country over the last number of years are taken up with people seeking housing. And, um, you know, this has to be seen as an opportunity to revitalise, re-energise and give life back to those towns and villages. And there are many buildings tied up in, in whether it's in relation to conveyancing, whether it's in relation to title, whether it's in relation to family disputes, whether it's in relation to um, issues of funding not being available. And these are, you know, this has to be, there has to be improvements to the CPO powers in order to initiate development, in order for those to be addressed. It should also be seen as an opportunity not only to rebuild and re-energise those communities, but indeed build new communities and, have, and, and learn from the mistakes of the past during the boom years, when, man, when we had the sprawl that we've seen in towns and villages uh, in, in the greater Dublin area and beyond, that, you know, that we're, we're, we're chasing our tail then in relation to the provision of services in education and in recreation and in transport and infrastructure. And you talked about yourself, the infrastructure deficit that's in areas. That there's an opportunity, for example, to, to, um, to create new sustainable communities uh, in the greater Dublin area and other areas where, where uh, you know, pilot schemes could be initiated, where you could reward those that, 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 that address infrastructure deficit, that bring new means and methods of transport and accessibility, that, that, you know, where you have known population trends, known population parameters. And then you can provide the services that are needed within that. And again, you know, you're talking about energy and sustainability and the, 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 the responsibilities that those in the construction sector will have uh, now with, with, with our obligations in relation to climate change and so forth. But they are real opportunities that can come out of a crisis that I think should be explored. But it has to be driven by an authority uh, that has the potential to raise extraordinary amounts of funding. Because the conventional methods, as good as they were in the 30s and the 70s, they won't work in this crisis. And, you know, I would hope and expect that we continue to explore the possibilities that exist in relation to what I've said in the hope that you will bring that sort of uh, proposal forward. A special purpose vehicle to drive the provision of residential units to address the crisis and the emergency that exists. Because everything that we've seen in recent years with the best of intentions and, and, and regard for those that sought uh, to deliver them. And I'm conscious of the 2020 strategy in relation to the provision of housing and 25,000, you said, uh, by the year 2020. You know, we can, we, we can count the amount of houses that have been constructed by local authorities uh, in, in, in recent years, despite the commitments that was made. And with, with all due respect, you're going to have to think outside the box. You have to come up with this a new initiative, new concept, new process. As good as they were in the past, they're not suitable for the present. And I would hope you would address those in your, in your, in your presentation by the end of July. Th thank you very much, Deputy Minister. There was a, quite a lot there, and I suppose some of it was an overview. But in, in particular, uh, one of the issues that Deputy Cowan raised, and you might give a little bit of uh, thought to your views on, is the, the whole area of finance. And certainly the committee has spent some time, having had the Department of Finance and the NTMA, and having looked at the NARPS model, uh, I suppose the, the, the question is, from your point of view, the opportunity to have a, a similar model uh, to provide funding for 
either approved housing bodies or local authorities, but very much on the NAM and NARPS model. Uh, you might explore that a little bit as Minister. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I mean, look, um, what, um, what the Deputy is saying around the need for a new approach is, is spot on. I mean, that's, that's why we need a new action plan. Um, uh, whether or not we should set up a, a national authority for housing, I'm not sure. I mean, we could, we could spend a lot of time trying to construct a new governance model, uh, or instead we could focus on taking a project management approach within the department and actually really driving uh, uh, you know, a results-based uh, um, uh, approach of setting targets and meeting them with local authorities. So you know, I, I, I'll certainly have a look at that. Um, but, but at the moment, our approach is very much trying to use the infrastructure that's there already in local authorities uh, to try and empower uh, both councils and chief executives um, to, to ask, to demand of them what they need to get results uh, and to try and help them then deliver. Um, maybe um, uh, we could add to that by a, a new uh, a new housing authority, uh, or or maybe that would that would uh, that would actually you know distract from that. I'm not sure. I mean, I'll, I'll certainly happily explore that concept. Um, I mean, don't forget we do have a housing agency, we do have a, a housing finance agency, we do have lots of local authorities that in the past had the capacity to manage housing stock and build out new housing stock reasonably well. Although in many cases uh, that hasn't been uh, um, some of that skill set has been lost. But we are we're gearing up local authorities to be able to do that now more effectively again. So like we have approved um, quite a lot of uh, increased staffing appointments for local authorities to be able to respond to that. And we've been doing the same within our own department. 420 extra people have been sanctioned for local authorities, particularly around this area. Um, and, um, uh, and there may well be more of, um, uh, of where that came from. Just in terms of a board panola, um, yeah, I mean, I think we are going to be more demanding of board panola. Uh, um, and, but in order for them to deliver, to be fair, we have to give them resources to respond. Uh, so if, if we're going to be demanding, they need to have the capacity to turn around decisions faster, and they're going to need more people and more resources to do that. Uh, and again, if that's necessary, I suspect we'll do it. And I've already had an initial conversation with the chair of board panola in that regard. Uh, in relation to part eight, um, I think I've spoken to some of you about my thinking around Part 8. Uh, we want to keep councillors involved in that decision-making process, but we also want to try and get decisions made quicker, um, uh, particularly around social housing projects. You know, um, we can't have a situation where we have communities deciding that they're going to block social housing projects in their areas because they don't want them for whatever reason. Um, if we're serious about integrating communities, whereby you have social housing mixed with private housing in a way that's, a, you know, that's appropriate, that creates diverse, vibrant communities, well then, we have to find a way of making that happen. And sometimes that's not popular in some areas. Um, and again, we have to find a way of having a system that can, that can make that happen. I wouldn't want to over-exaggerate, though, um, the, the role of Part 8 in terms of you know, preventing things from happening. Um, from a planning point of view, you know, it is important to say like planning isn't... Yeah, planning is part of, of the issue, but you know, there are, there's enough planning for 27,000 houses in Dublin, so you know, the planning system has, has delivered uh, um, you know, uh, in a way that can allow house building to start. Um, the, um, uh, in terms of, um, uh, of the NARPS model, which is a good model, I think, NAMA have essentially created uh, a model which is, of course, off balance sheet that allows them to essentially purchase or make uh, properties available for a long-term lease for approved housing bodies, which I think is quite a successful model that we can replicate uh, and maybe through ISAF uh, could, could do that, uh, probably working in coordination with the housing, um, housing agency to be able to make more stock available both to, um, to local authorities but in particular to approved housing bodies who have shown themselves to be able to work this uh, structure very effectively in recent years. Uh, and I do. Minister, I'm sorry for interrupting you on NARPS. There's a vote just being uh, called, and I think at this stage we'll suspend for a few moments. In fact, it'll probably be a bit longer than a few moments. We'll suspend till the voting is finished and we'll resume immediately after the voting, if that's okay. Thank you, members. Thank you.